Amen is right. They're just trained. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Amen to that. I want to read some of those lyrics that we just sang. So I think sometimes we sing songs and we just, the words come out, but we don't sit and think and chew on the words. I hear the Savior say, so this song is Jesus speaking to us, your strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. When we sing, we respond, Lord, now indeed I find your power and yours alone can change the leper spots and melt this heart of stone. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. His power and his alone can change the leper spots and change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. His power alone. Seniors, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear that you are too weak. You are not strong enough. Not strong enough to make it in this world. Not strong enough to achieve your dreams. Not strong enough to be a good husband or wife or father or mother. You are not strong enough. But I know the one who is. And if you find your strength in him, if you find him as the one and only in your life who you go to for your refuge, the one and only you go to when you recognize this truth, man, he is faithful. Find in him your all in all. And church, for the rest of us, like it's so, it's so easy and we're so quick to forget that fact. Way too often, I forget that reality. I am weak physically, emotionally, spiritually. My faith is too weak. My trust is too small. My fears and my doubts are too noisy. I need reminded day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year to praise the one who paid my debt. Paid it all in full to Telestai, to remember and to rest in his finished work for me. And I tell you what, that in turn, reinvigorates me to go and to do the hard work of walking with him while we live in enemy territory, seeking out the lost, trying to help other believers to do the same. And this morning, as we are almost done with Exodus, this morning's text is the, the largest section we're going to go through in one week through this entire series. And honestly, it's one of those passages that I've kind of skipped over in my past readings. Because it seems like he's, Moses is just repeating everything he's already said from Exodus 26 all the way to 31. And maybe it's because I was at Edge last weekend. Maybe it's just because I really enjoyed going through Exodus, studying and preaching through this series but I'm seriously encouraged and challenged this week by this text. I don't know. Um, my prayer for us all this morning is that it encourages and challenges you as well. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 35. We're going to jump around a little bit. I'll have the text on the screen because we're jumping so much. We're going to start in verse 5. Exodus, actually, we're going to start in verse 4. That's verse 4. Exodus 35, verse 4. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. 
Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, all oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Skipping to verse 20. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, and everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used for the tent of meeting, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, all who were of a willing heart, brought brooches, and earrings, and signet rings, and armlets, all sorts of gold objects, every man dedicating an offering of gold to the Lord. And everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarns or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or goat skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's contribution. Continuing in verse 24. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. And every skillful woman spun with her hands and they all brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastpiece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. Skip into chapter 36, beginning in verse 1. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from the task that he was doing and said to Moses, Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may that be the cry of us as well. Israel had to be restrained from giving back to you. Lord, may we be a people who have to be restrained from giving back to you because of generous hearts and generous hands. Lord, we pray this morning that your spirit would illuminate this text to us, that, that you would exhort us, that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, that you would spur us on towards love and good deeds and towards your glory and the advancement of your kingdom in this world. Lord, speak to us this morning, to each of us where we are, what we each need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this text is a, a beautiful passage, beautiful picture of a proper response to God's word. If you remember all the way back to when we started this series in Exodus, I, I told you that Exodus is not trying to elevate the people of Israel. It does not encourage us to praise Israel at all. Instead, the Israelites are presented as grumbling and complaining, idol-worshiping people. People who see God face to face and then make the wrong choice. And we continue to see that in the people of Israel for generation after generation. But, but, this passage right here, this passage is different. You see, Exodus, it portrays Israel 
like we should see ourselves as broken people, sinful, rebellious, stupid at times. But this passage is one of the very few times where Israel actually does what God commands and with the right hearts. They do the right thing for the right reason. It's an example of obedience from the heart. This morning I have five questions for us. Five questions to ponder and to go home and and evaluate ourselves by. First one. Do I jump with generous heart and hands when I see a need? You see, Israel hears God's commands from the lips of Moses and he jumps into action. They they hear all the things that are needed for the building of the tabernacle so that God himself can dwell with his people in their presence right in the middle of camp in all of his blazing holiness and his awesome glory, and they immediately scatter like ants. They just go everywhere back to their tents. They start gathering whatever they have that they can contribute to the building of God's tent. It's amazing to see. There's no hesitation here. They jump in with both feet. There's no dipping their toe in the water to see, is it warm enough? Is it too cold? They don't say, well, let me pray about it and see what I might be able to contribute out of my overflow. God makes the need known and everyone chips in with what they have. We see the same thing happen in the early church in Acts 2, verse 45. It says, and the, the church, the, the people, the believers, the followers of Jesus, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They all gave for the good of the whole. And I want you to notice how their hearts are described in this passage. Moses says in verse 5, 35 verse 5, whoever is of a generous heart. Then look at verse 21. Everyone whose heart stirred him. Verse 22, all who were of a willing heart. Verse 26, all the women whose heart stirred them to use their skill. Verse 29, all of the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work of the Lord that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering. It wasn't under compulsion, it wasn't begrudgingly, it wasn't out of duty, it wasn't out of guilt or fear. It was from a willing heart of joy and generosity, a heart that wanted to serve the Lord in any way that they could. A heart that was moved to give and to serve. And as I was reading through this passage this week, I had to ask the question, do I have a heart like that? Is your heart generous? Do we respond when we find or see or come across needs with generous giving? Giving of what we have, giving of what we can do. You see, it wasn't just financial contributions that were emphasized here. There were also acts of service. The women who knew how to spin fabric or yarn, or threads, whatever, the ones who knew how to sew, they jumped in to serve. The men who knew how to build, the men who knew how to carve, the men who knew how to forge metal, the men who knew how to work, the men who knew how to assemble, they jumped into service. 36 verse 2, every craftsman, it's not most of the craftsmen, it's every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill. Everyone whose heart stirred him came up to do the work. This is beautiful. Of the entire nation of Israel, every single person listened to the stirrings of their heart. That is not normal. That is supernatural. They listened to the stirrings of their heart and they recognized 
the blessings of the Lord as divinely and sovereignly orchestrated for this specific task. So Billy Bob, Israelite, is like, man, I, I, don't, I don't have much. But man, I do have all of these four by four posts of acacia wood that I was wondering what I was going to do with them. They've been sitting in the barn back here. And Moses has said, like, we need 784,000 four by four posts. Well, I got like 741,000. Like, let's bring them in. Get the trailer. And Sue over here, Israelite, she's like, man, I, I can't build. I don't, I've never worked with gold before, but I've, I've sewed a lot of dresses in my day. I can make some curtains. And they all come together and they work together to build this amazing house for the Lord. Now think about this. Where did these people get all of this stuff? How did these poor slaves, literally they were slaves less than 12 months before. The temple is, or the tabernacle is constructed eight days shy of one year from being released from Egypt. So, I mean, it's, there's still probably 11 months here, 10 months. Where did they get all this stuff? Well, if you remember back from Exodus 12, verse 36, they got it all from Egypt. And the Lord had given the people, Israel, favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that the Egyptians let them have what they had asked for. Thus, Israel plundered the Egyptians. And the people are standing here at the foot of Mount Sinai and they're recognizing, like, I didn't have this stuff 12 months ago. They recognized that all that they had was from the Lord. He was the one who had provided it. And they gave only what the Lord had already given to them. 1 Chronicles 29, 14 says, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, Lord, and of your own we have given to you. The same is true of us today. Everything we have has already been given to us from the Father. And that's what made Israel willing givers. It describes them seven times in chapter 35 as willing givers. Seven times. And they give so much that Moses has to put his foot down and say, Enough! Stop! We have plenty. We have too much. Stop giving. Do you realize how much was given? So I did some math. 5,310 pounds of bronze. 7,544 pounds of silver. 2,193 pounds of gold. Just those three metals alone add up in today's prices to $65,675,875. That's not including the wood. That's not including the fabric. $65 million from people who had been slaves less than a year before. You want to talk about plundering Egypt. That's crazy. Reminds me of the Macedonian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 5, who Paul says they gave out of their deep poverty. They gave lavishly for the work of the ministry. Generous giving stems from a heart that is right with God. You see, where the heart is right and motives of personal holiness are at work, the purse strings the wallet straps, they get released, and problems of finance and supply find their end. Do we see our finances like that? Do we see our skill set like that? Do we see ourselves and our possessions as vessels in the hands of the Almighty to use and to bless in whatever ways he wants to use us? You have been blessed to be a blessing. Stole that from Steve Knapp. When God says jump, do we ask why? 
Or do we start jumping and ask God, now how high do you want me to jump? Do we need a reason or an explanation or do we simply trust him and cannonball in? Man, I want to be a God, I want to be a man of God who trusts him enough to stand on the cliff and when he says jump, to not look around or down or hesitate, but simply to trust him and dive off headfirst. All we have is yours, God. Use it all as you wish. But why all this repetition? It's so easy to think that this section is just a pointless repeating of what's already been said. But it's not pointless. There's reason that there are four lists of the tabernacle construction project. There's reason for it. Each time it's listed out, there's a different purpose, there's a different concentration, and there's a different emphasis. So we already preached through 25 through 31. We showed you all the pictures of the temple or the tabernacle and, and all the pieces and how they fit together. That whole first list, it centers around the Ark of the Covenant, the theological, the doctrinal priorities of the Ark as God's dwelling place. And then from there, it flows out from the Ark into all the other pieces. Well, here in 36 through 39, it's really the manufacturing process. Its concentration is on the builders, Ahaliab and Bezalel, and kind of their thought process of here's how we should build it in order that makes the most logical and practical sense. And it emphasizes that building order process to build the pieces. Then in chapter 40, verses 1 through 6, we get the third time that God tells them, this time, how to assemble it. Here's how it should be built. This is the, the little you know, paper that dads never read when you open up the, the box and it needs, it needs assembled, right? Well, I'll figure it out. I know what the bolts are for. And then we mess up, like, I got 18 bolts left and I, it seems to be built. You know? And then the kid falls out of the crib. This is the thing. God's like, here's how you need to assemble it. Guess what? You can't put a ark, an Ark of the Covenant if you don't have the tent built yet. And so he's walking through the process. Here's how you assemble it. And it's a high-level uh, process. Then the last one in 40, 17 through 33 concentrates on this element. That Israel did exactly what God told them to do. It concentrates on their obedience down to the smallest detail. They did exactly what God had told them. And so it goes into more, more details than even the beginning of chapter 40 does. You see, there's reason. God doesn't put stuff in his word just because he's like, ah, I had five more pages to fit before the, the editor was going to be happy with my, my work. He has reason for why he put things in his revelation to us. Here's the point. The Israelites received the instruction of the Lord and they obeyed it. Exactly like God told them to. They were thoughtful and exact when it came to building God's tent. In all that you do, do all to the glory of God. They did that. They built everything according to all that the Lord commanded. And get this, seven times in chapter 39, it is reiterated in regard to the individual articles that were made. That they did it as the Lord commanded. Verse 1, 5, 7, 21, 26, 29, and 32. Seven times it's emphasized they did exactly as the Lord commanded in regard to the tabernacle articles. In verse, chapter 40, verse 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, 29, and 32. And three times it's emphasized that they did exactly as the Lord commanded in regard to the work as a whole. 39, 32, 39, 42, and 40, 16. The point is this. They listened intently and they obeyed precisely. They didn't look at the blueprints and be like, eh, it's good enough for who it's made for. Well... Actually, maybe they did, because it was made for God and his perfect holiness. 
Church, do we do that? Do I listen and obey the first time that God instructs me, or do I come up with excuses? Do I listen and obey? You see, Israel never got to hear the Lord's commands the first time. Because they were too busy partying and worshiping the golden calf. If you paid attention, 31, 26 through 31, God gives Moses the instructions. Moses doesn't make it down the mountain and sees the golden calf. Moses never even got to tell them the plans for the tabernacle when he came down because they were too busy in their own sin. Sometimes that's us too. Sometimes we don't listen. Sometimes we don't even hear God's word or pay attention to God's voice because we're so caught up in our own desires and our own situations and our own sinfulness that we are deaf to the Lord's voice. Selective hearing is what my wife calls it. Or if your kid, my kids at least, it's because you have your earbuds on full blast. Problem is we're playing the music of me, myself, and I. And it's where I was before the Lord grabbed a hold of me at you and I. Um, I knew what I was supposed to be doing, but I had better things to do. I had track to worry about. I had football games to play. Ultimate Frisbee was my Thursday night activity, so I couldn't go to the Bible study that I'd been invited to. And so God got at my attention, playing Ultimate Frisbee in the Unidome, blew, my, blew out my knee, took away all of it in one go. That next Thursday when I got invited to Bible study, I can tell you for a fact I showed up. But if it wasn't for that, I don't know if I ever would have went. I was too content in what I wanted to do and what I was able to do and what I liked to do. I didn't even realize what I was missing. And I think God does that in a lot of our lives. We get too busy. We get too content. And we don't even recognize what we're missing. And we don't even hear God's voice saying, hey, come on, stop, come over here. You need this. You need me. Come over here. My arms are open. We just ignore it all. But church, as the living, breathing, walking, talking temples of the living God, we have been anointed and we have been set apart to honor him in our thoughts and our words and our actions. John says, or Jesus says in John 14, 23, he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. In every setting we find ourselves, we are called to lay down our lives and to follow Christ at his word, to live for him and not for ourselves, to walk like him, to talk like him and think like him, obeying his teachings in all things. You know, a lot of us know the beginning of the Great Commission, but not many of us recognize the end of the Great Commission. The last command of the Great Commission is to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. To obey Jesus' teachings. Whatever we do should be done in God's way, not in our way. At work, at home, at school, at play. There's a godly way to do it. Do we listen to and obey God's word or do we think that we have a better understanding of our own personal situations than God does? See, the problem of the world, the problem with us is that every man's thoughts seem right in his own eyes. That's the problem. You think you have the best way to do things. You think you know what's best. So do I. Problem is, it's likely true that none of us do. It's not a you or me issue, it's a us or God issue. 
And there's all kinds of reasons why we might not listen or obey God's instructions, but all of them are nothing but excuses. And you know what excuses are. We all have them, they all stink. Adam and Eve had excuses too. They didn't work then, they don't work now. See, God knows your heart. He knows what's in it. He knows better than you even do. And the problem is, excuses don't get us very far with an all-knowing God. But in our arrogance and our sin, we still try. Church, we need to listen and obey God's word out of love for him, trusting and believing that his ways are better than our ways at all times and in all situations. But sometimes, sometimes we have the wrong motive. Sometimes we start in the wrong place. It's so easy to jump into action out of duty to serve the Lord. But I want us to look back at the beginning of chapter 35, verses 1 through 3. Before Moses gives the marching orders to go and build, go and gather, go and build, go and assemble, go and construct my tent. What's he say first? Moses assembles all the congregation of the people of Israel and he says to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Notice, commanded you to do. Look what he says in verse 2. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest holy to the lord whoever does any work on it shall be put to death you shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the sabbath day wait what you said these are what you commanding me to do but now you're telling me to rest yes yes that's the key before you go and do Rest, Sabbath, before Israel builds a single item, before they gather any supplies, their rest in God is emphasized. Church, we shall not work with God if we have not known what it is to rest with God. The work was not the end goal. The relationship with his people was stop working and serving as a means to please God. It doesn't work. Stop working and serving and trying to live righteously, thinking that you are earning His blessing. It's so easy to fall into the trap of believing that, yes, my justification, my forgiveness of my sin came through grace by faith, but that was then, and now it's up to me. It's up to me to continue the work and to move the work forward, and so my sanctification now comes as I obey God's law. That is so far from the truth. But it's our tendency, that's our tendency as a church, as a people, as a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, God-exalting church, that's our tendency. You're saved by grace, but then you continue it through obedience. It's also the natural tendency for firstborns to emphasize rule following. It's the tendency for type C personalities to have a drive to do things right All three strikes against me. I'm driven to succeed and to do so in the right way, and I want to honor God in everything that I do. And yet, sometimes, truthfully, oftentimes, I can find myself needing to be reminded that my good works for the Lord are still filthy rags. I find myself forgetting that it is finished at the cross. Oh, foolish Galatian, having begun by the Spirit, am I now being perfected by the flesh? 
We're not saved by our works and neither are we sanctified by our works. Do not let your good works, your service for the Lord be done out of duty or as a a means of gaining God's favor. It doesn't work and it's not going to get you where you think it will. Rest in the finished work of Christ alone. Rest in the God who never changes. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. God's favor does not rest on Israel because they are faithfully and obediently building his tabernacle. God's favor rests on Israel because he's a God of loving, merciful kindness. It rests on them purely because of his grace poured out for them through Christ. And the disaster of the golden calf is where Israel learns the sinfulness of sin and the exceeding graciousness of God's grace, but also the inflexible determination of God to fulfill his stated purposes for his people. Those four lists that we walked through, God doesn't change a single step. He might emphasize different things. He might put them in a different order, but nothing changed. Even though the golden calf put God's building project on pause, it didn't change the blueprints or the purposes. There is no change in God, and so there are no changes in the specifications of the tabernacle and why they are repeated without alteration or adjustment. Malachi 3.6 I, the Lord, do not change. Why? So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. That's awesome. There is hope for sinners like you and me. We are not destroyed, not because we are awesome or because we are doing things the right way, but because God does not change. You can work your fingers to the bone for Jesus. You can have absolute perfect theology, perfect attendance at church, gold star for you. You can have read the Bible 100 times over. You can pray all day long. You can be a person who doesn't dance or drink or smoke or chew or go with girls who do. That is not why God loves you. That is not why you're not destroyed. You're not destroyed because God doesn't change. You're not destroyed because Jesus paid the price. Rest in him. He is your rest. And Israel needed reminded of that before they even started serving him. And so do we. Find your rest in the unchangeable God who loves you and died for you. And keep finding your rest in him. And then... You may work. My last question for us, church. Sorry, I guess I have one more. We gotta hurry up. In this entire building process, process, God makes it abundantly clear the one who provided everything. He provided all the materials, He provided all of the skills and empowered the workers with the intelligence and the skills necessary to accomplish it. But God was also the one in charge. He said who would be skilled in engraving. He said who would be skilled in spinning. He said who would have the onyx stones. He said who would have the acacia wood. He said, and he provided. God is the one who provides the resources, and God is the one who empowers the individuals with all the skills and wisdom to use those resources he has blessed them with for his divine plans and his divine purposes. So churches are confidence in ourselves or in the God who richly provides and empowers. Don't get your mind twisted into thinking that this is all about you. We're so good at that. It never has been and it never will be. I am nothing in myself. I have no confidence in the flesh. All of our righteousness comes through faith in Christ. A righteousness from God earned by Christ's perfect life of obedience that's credited to you and to me. That's where your confidence must lie. Not in your own skills or abilities. Not in your own knowledge or holiness. Or your money or your resources or your name or your fame. 
Our confidence has to be rooted in Christ's work on our behalf. And just like God provided everything necessary for the building of the tabernacle, so too he provided everything necessary for your salvation. In Christ, we find that the work of redemption, the work of forgiveness, the work of imputed righteousness, the work of sanctification, the work of future glorification is all already complete in Jesus. It's finished. There's nothing left for you to do. There's nothing left for you to prove. There's nothing left for you to earn. Nothing left at all. And if you're like me, and I know I am, I need reminded of that. He's already provided everything, all the direction, all the ability, all the resources, even the desire. Christ is our substitute sacrifice, like the ram that God provided to Abraham in substitute for Isaac. The ram took Isaac's place on the altar, just like Jesus took our place on the cross. Ezekiel 36 tells us that God is the one who will put a new heart in you. He will put his spirit in us, and he will cause us to walk in his statutes and to be careful to obey his rules. God does it. It's his work. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, Paul declares that even our faith is a gift of God. Our ability to believe him at his word, to trust in the promises of the gospel, are evidence of God's amazing grace in our lives. We are his workmanship, his project, his work. In John 6, 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one comes to Jesus unless God draws them. Jesus is the one who gives the desire and the ability to come to him. The whole process of salvation is nothing but grace. Every step is grace. It is all grace. Church, do you believe that? Do you believe that God has provided everything for you in Christ? I don't have to work for it anymore. I don't have to strive. I can just rest in my Savior who died for me. I don't have to beat myself. There's no sweat or blood or good deeds or self-righteous works that can earn it. He offers his forgiveness. He offers redemption as a free gift. And before we take communion this morning, I just want to follow back up with the words of that last song. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Church, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, man, we are so unworthy. We are broken. We are not as good as we think we ever have been on our best days. And yet, God, you are better than all of it. The perfect obedience of Jesus poured out for us. All so that us unrighteous, unworthy sinners could be seen by the Father as good and holy and perfect and set apart. God, we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we get to celebrate that fact. We celebrate the fact that Christ is our all, that he paid it all for us. And we remember that and we celebrate that through the taking of communion, taking of the bread, which represents his body broken on the cross and taking of the juice, which represents his blood spilled on the cross. And in that we remember and in that we celebrate. And so here's a uh, instruction from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we eat and we drink today in remembrance of the fact of what Christ did on the cross, and we celebrate that together as we rest in that work. Well, I want to invite the men uh, who I asked to help me to come on up. And as I do, I want to mention that we have an open communion table here at Community Bible Church, which means you do not need to be a member or a regular attender of CBC to partake with us. Uh, we just encourage, we do request that you be a, a professed follower of Jesus. And parents, we allow you to, just to work with your kids to decide if they are ready for this this morning. We're going to pass the bread, we're going to pray, and we're going to eat together. Then we'll pass the cup, and we will pray, and we will drink together. Let me say a prayer as we begin. Father, we're so thankful that we can come to this table this morning and that we can celebrate, remember, revel in the work of Jesus, that he paid it all. And so we come this morning in Jesus' name. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, and the body that was broken. We do this in remembrance of that fact. Let's eat together. Also, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for many. Do this in remembrance of me. And so thank you, Father, for this cup, the blood that was spilled. We're so grateful in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Music team, come up and, and uh, join us up here. Just to reiterate. Jesus says, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Grateful for that this morning. Amen. The rock of ages, the God who never changes is the reason that we can take our faith in Christ and be confident that it will hold us for all eternity because the same God before creation the same God in Israel's day is the same God in Jesus' day, is the same God in our day, and will be the same God for all of eternity. Man, Amen. seniors, you hold on to that truth. Hold on to that truth that God never changes, and he can be trusted. He is faithful. He will never let you down. Church, we need reminded of the same thing. Encourage you to head into the gym. There's some snacks and stuff in there, and uh, highlight a verse in each of the seniors' Bibles of something that they can hold on to that when they're going through a rough time, they can open up and be encouraged by the church and be encouraged by God's word and something that's held you. Um, and so I'd encourage you to do that. Feel free to do that on, on all of the senior Bibles in there and then enjoy some snacks as well. Go church. You've been blessed. Be a blessing. Be a blessing.